I'm Patricia Grabarek. And I'm Katina Sawyer, and welcome to the Worker Being Podcast. So today, Katina, you've got something exciting to share with us in terms of your article. What's the topic? Yes, my topic for today is around the impact of self-care, or as the academic literature calls it, self-compassion, on buffering people from the impacts of workplace loneliness, which we know was uh, an important concept or an important experience during COVID. Um, but it could be important anytime, especially as people are trying to figure out how to work remotely and might not be seeing people as much as they used to, or companies are trying to figure out ways to build community. So we're going to talk a little bit about work loneliness, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of self-compassion for helping to uh, maybe help you with some of the impacts that are related to loneliness. Interesting. Yeah. Loneliness, uh, such a fascinating topic, I think, in terms of the work environment, right? We're not just, I don't know. It's not something you think about often, but it happens fairly frequently, I would say. Yeah. So I am curious yeah. to dive into it. Yeah. It's not something that's gotten a lot of attention historically, but definitely it has had um, a big impact um, on the way that people are working right now. And uh, as the article will get further into Um, there are some characteristics that lead people to be lonely that might be things that are more likely to be occurring in the modern workforce post COVID than pre COVID. So it might be something we're dealing with for a long time, unfortunately, but we'll give you some tips for what to do if you are experiencing that. Well, I'm excited to hear that, but before we dive in, let's hear about how you're doing. What's going on with you? Um, I'm doing pretty good. This is a pretty normal week for me. Um, the only thing that's kind of like weird that's going on is that I, for my, um, like one of my, I guess like resolutions last year, I was trying to switch over all my products to like natural products and it's been going really well. And I liked everything that I've used, but I used like a natural deodorant. Um, I was telling you a little bit about Mm -hmm. this, but, um, and I broke out in this like insane rash under my armpits and it hurt so bad. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, that's been kind of weird. And it's one of those things where like, it's an, it's like internal, it's like cystic. Yeah. So you can't really see it that much, but it like kills. Yeah. So I feel like when like, I was like showing it to like my mom and Brendan, I feel like I seemed like a crazy person. Cause I was just like, it hurts so bad, but it like doesn't really look that bad if that makes sense (laughs) yeah (laughs) um but I'm on an antibiotic now and uh like the first couple days I was on it I was feeling like kind of feverish and like not great um and I was getting a little worried that they that it wasn't gonna work but then all of a sudden today they started hurting a little less and I'm feeling a little better so I'm hoping it just continues in that trajectory for um, the rest of the week because if the antibiotic doesn't work by Saturday I have to go get them like cut open oh no and, and I don't want that okay well we're all gonna be hoping that doesn't happen because that Thank sounds you. awful oh yes I have been like dreading that like I do not want that <laughs> Why does it not surprise me, though, that, that happened to you? I feel like I I, I have. So I will tell you that I did something similar happened, but not to the extreme as you did. Been for you, it's yeah. always more extreme. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I I tried natural deodorant and I had I, I had like a big rash that broke out on both armpits. And then at one point, like I thought I was like, oh, I'm just going to work through it and I fight through it. And then I got like uh, it completely discolored my skin and it was like. I had like gray armpits for like six months, which was disgusting. Really? You know, like no matter what I, I mean, I could shave my armpits all I wanted, but they still looked gray and weird. So <laughs> it was terrible. Oh. Um, but I figured out that it was baking soda. That was the mm. ingredient that really did not do well. And I, I was like Googling it and like reading about it. And a lot of people react to baking soda in, in natural deodorants. So I have yeah. to, I've tried a few without baking soda um, which I will say are not very strong. So there's that problem. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I can't, I stay away from baking soda. So I don't know if you looked at the ingredients of the one that you reacted to, yeah. but it has coconut oil and charcoal, um, which generally I don't react to, but I don't really use either of them very much. Mm. And like, 
not in like a paste. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that stays on me. So I feel like um, I don't know, but I do know that I Googled the brand and like a third of the reviews were like, this gave me a rash. <laughs> but um, but it, I got it. Uh, my mom got it for me. And like, obviously she felt so bad. She tried it too, but she's a normal person. And when it started to like burn, like the very first time she used it and it kind of started to burn, she was like, oh, I'm not going to use that again. And meanwhile, I was Googling like natural deodorant burns and people were like, yes, like your skin has to adjust <laughs> to the naturalness of the deodorant. So I was just like, it's going to happen. Like the burning is normal. I just have to work through it. And then like it didn't, it was not. Oh, um, no. But it was like a brand new brand when my mom got it. So I feel like it had like barely any reviews. Mm. It was like the debut or whatever. Yeah. And then like now there's like thousands of reviews and like a thousand of them is just like, this gave me a rash. This gave me a cyst under my arm. And I was like, oh, Okay, I probably should have <laughs> read the reviews before I like went all in on being on committing to the fact that I was just going to use it, even though it was burning me. That's um, really unfortunate and also funny. But yeah. um, I will say yes. that I actually used to like, you know, what was like all the rage to like use coconut oil instead of moisturizers. There was like a yeah. time period mm-hmm. where that was the case. And anytime I would do that on my legs after shaving, I would break out like crazy. So... I won't use anything with coconut oil anymore either. <laughs> ah. Well, maybe I have that. I don't know. It was just like so annoying because I was like, I'm trying to like not use like aluminum for the purpose of like doing something better for me. And then my body's just like, no, yeah. like reacting to this. And I was like, this is so irritating. So anyway, like literally irritating. But um, but now like all week I can't use any deodorant and I can't shave. So luckily I don't have to go anywhere, <laughs> but I just feel like a freako. Cause like I have these like lumps in my arm and I'm like, it's just gross. So like, I know that I'm like fine, but I feel, you know how like sometimes you can feel worse than you are because there's like, you just don't feel your best but Mm -hmm. like you're actually kind of fine yep that's kind of what it is like I just feel gross and so I'm just like I'm disgusting and sick (laughs) go away (laughs) (laughs) oh man no I know what you mean like that was like my weird gray armpits for a little bit like yeah I was totally fine and healthy it was just a weird skin reaction and it went away but I felt real gross for a while there yeah well yes so I know get through it that's really the only (laughs) excitement that I've been having is uh this armpit saga um so hopefully you have something more exciting going on with you uh what do you have going on um well I literally just had a kitten come up and cuddle up with me so right now I'm recording with a with a a kitten on my uh kitten on my chest basically she's like kind of leaning on the desk and me at the same time um kitten friend. yeah they're so funny they're just so cute so it's been quite an adventure with these two I'm afraid she's gonna do something crazy like I don't know knock over the microphone or who knows so if you hear something weird from my end it's like it's a kitten <laughs> sure um, it is this now everything you do that's weird you'll be like oh no. that was a kitten obviously <laughs> <It was a kitten>. <laughs> <laughs> um but the same one so right now it's Ray that's laying like on me And she, today, in the middle of a meeting, luckily it was just like a one-on-one with one of my employees, but it was a video chat. And all of a sudden, I like probably made the weirdest face because she jumped up on my chair or like right behind my chair. I was like kind of leaning forward. So there's a gap between my back and the chair and then proceeded to climb my back and attack what? my hair from behind and I can't <laughs> att- I can't get her because she's behind me you know so I'm like trying to reach back right. and she's like this tiny little nugget so it's like impossible to get her and she's just attacking my hair and then finally she like climbs to- and like I I'm, like apologizing to my employee I'm like I'm sorry there's a cat on my back like I don't know what to say <laughs> and-, and so then like she climbs to the front and I'm like oh my gosh um so then I was able to finally get her off of me but I as soon as I picked her up, she swatted at my nose and then scratched my nose. And I was like, what is happening right now? <laughs> like, it was so ridiculous. <laughs> um, That's so funny. Yeah, like, they are just, they're so sweet. Like, they're very cuddly, very sweet. But they get into these moods where they just are, like, completely bonkers. And I don't know how to, like, I just forgot kitten mode. <laughs> like, they, they'll they right. grow out of it, I know. And they'll be, like, more normal. And then they also won't weigh, like, four pounds and climb my back won't be possible anymore um yeah but it's just such a 
it's such a funny phase. Like they're they're really comfortable here now. Like it's been enough weeks that they're they've gotten comfortable with us, and so they're like getting into more and more trouble because they're like testing their boundaries and limits. And I'm like, oh my god, how is this a thing that is happening to us? But Aww. it's cute, but it's crazy. <laughs> that's so cute though I mean it is it is you're right like it's it's disruptive but it's so cute that you can't be that I know it's like oh this tiny little thing like I mean they're so small like four pounds is nothing they're just these tiny little munchkins uh so yeah it's very hard to stay mad when they climb your back and do weird things and again very glad there wasn't like a client meeting or like (laughs) something like that but they They really want to hang out on my desk all the time. And like, it's cute because they just want to be near me and they're just like hanging out near me. But sometimes it gets a little bit much. (laughs) Yeah. You're like, okay, I have actual things. Yeah. I also told my mom that you got kittens. I didn't tell you this. (laughs) And uh, she asked about their names and I told her and she was like, Ray, I didn't tell her like that they were like Hawaiian themed or whatever. So she understood. She like knows what Kona is, but she was like, Ray, why Ray? And for some reason, just like to see like what she would say, I just said they named him after Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> they named her after Everybody Loves Raymond. They love the show Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom was like, oh, that's great. I love Everybody Loves Raymond. That's such a great name. And then, like, five minutes, and then like five minutes later, I was like, guess what? And she was like, what? And I was like, they didn't name their cat after Everybody Loves Raymond. I lied. <laughs> Your mom was like, what? She was like, why would they na- why would you lie about that? I was like, I don't know, but it was kind of funny because her reaction was so positive. She was like, that's so great. I love everybody Aww. loves <laughs> It's because your mom is so sweet. That's so funny. She was like, so, so very supportive of the name, even though it's based on an old TV show. <laughs> I forgot that I did that, but it was really funny. That is really funny. Well, uh, just my mom's reaction was so enthusiastic. Like, what a great name for a cat <laughs> after everybody loves Raymond <laughs> um <laughs> well uh anyway I told her the truth and she liked the real reason better but. yeah <laughs> well they at least match that way because then I feel like we should have done something different if we really cared about that show so much I don't even know anything about that show like I couldn't even tell you like like Ray and like what's his brother oh Robert, Robert. but then they'd be boys instead okay. of girls but I mean I guess they could have really yeah. cool like gender neutral names yeah Bobby and Ray. Bobby Ray. Oh, oh. My God. oh. <laughs> well. <laughs> now they're country cats. Yeah, no, I think they're going to stay Kona <laughs> and Manta Ray. <Yeah. laughs> I agree. I agree. Um, but yeah, anyway. Well, I'm glad that you're surrounded by cute kittens in your house. That's lovely. Yes, they are very lovely. Um, but I feel like every week I'll probably have a new story of some craziness that they got into climbing who knows what at least this time we'll be ready yeah I didn't actually look at my back so I don't know how many scratches I got from that climb but (laughs) it's okay it's worth it it's the climb it's worth it isn't that a Miley Cyrus song Uh, the climb I have no idea you would know better than me (laughs) it is you should listen to it and play it every time your cat climbs you (laughs) all right all right it'll be their their theme song It'll seem very inspirational that way instead of annoying. (laughs) (laughs) Our little babies. But anyways, I feel like we've been on weird tangents of going from like armpit cysts to kittens. Yeah, to cats, to my little Um, But what about loneliness? (laughs) Um, Yeah, sure. We're not even going to try today to make a transition. No. We're just going to jump in. It's too random. Our topics have been too random anyway, so we got to go that way. We're just going to go with the theme of random. Okay. So let's talk about loneliness. So the article is called Depending Upon Your Own Kindness, The Moderating Role of Self-Compassion on the Within-Person Consequences of Work Loneliness During the COVID-19 Pandemic, which is a lot of words, um, but I'll break it all down. It is by Stephanie Andel, Winnie Shen, and Mariana Arvin, and it was just published this year in the Journal of Occupational Health Psychology. Awesome. So the article is basically taking place, as a lot of our articles this year have been, during COVID, but I think actually it has a lot of relevance to the way work is going to be done for a long time um, in terms of thinking through um, what 
are some of the antecedents that they found of work loneliness. And to me, I think it's really a call for organizations to spend some time really thinking about how they're structuring employees' work um, when they're adjusting to potentially new ways of working post-COVID. So what the model looked at was during COVID for eight weeks during the COVID pandemic early on, they gave people a survey every week that assessed different factors that might promote work loneliness, work loneliness, and then some factors that are associated with work loneliness. Okay. Um, and they were interested in looking at what the causes and impacts of work loneliness were, but they were particularly interested in what people could do to sort of stop themselves from experiencing negative impacts of work loneliness because they pretty much assumed that loneliness wasn't going to be a good thing. Right. Right. And so they honed in on this idea of self-compassion, um, which I think more colloquially, like I was saying, is known as self-care um, as a potential way of buffering yourself from those negative impacts if you experience work loneliness. Um, and so I was interested in this from our perspective because um, these are obviously uh, the outcomes are related to well-being, but also people talk about self-care a lot, but I don't think we really know exactly what it is from a scientific perspective. And so I was more curious to learn about that and then to see what its impacts might be on something I think a lot of people might be facing right now. I think it's really interesting. Um, I, I'm very excited to learn about the self-compassion, self-care uh, concept as well, because that is something that I've thought a lot about is we talk about self-care and like we kind of all define it probably our own way, right? Like we all generally know what we're talking about, but has it actually been defined well in a scientific perspective? So I'm very curious to hear about self-compassion and what that means and how that ties into what we generally think of as self-care. Yeah. So maybe we should start there because that's kind of a key focus of the article. And then we can kind of talk about why it might um, have some positive impacts on uh, people experiencing work loneliness. So self-care we often think of as being something that I think like it's marketed as sort of like something that has to do with treating yourself to a product or service. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's kind of what I think of when I think of like self-care as I see it in the world. When people are promoting self-care, it's like, oh, like get a smoothie, self-care, like go to yoga, self-care, go to spin class, self-care, you know, like, and all those things I'm not saying don't have to fall under the umbrella, but it feels very like, um, do this and you'll be cared for kind of thing, as opposed to more like reflecting on yourself and what you need. Um, and so I think that, um, the actual definition of self-care gets a lot more at like being reflective and understanding of yourself as a person and providing yourself with the care and acceptance that you need. Uh, so it's much more psychological than like externally based. So like, I guess the underlying thing of what I'm saying is I feel like a lot of what we think about of self-care is like, there's something external to me that I need to buy or do in order to take care of myself. But sometimes like it's more inward focused in the way we think about ourselves that could be termed self-care. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's instead of being this kind of like capitalistic or the sales tactic almost, it is more about an internal understanding of what you need. Yeah. Yeah, and and so I was curious because um they use like a short form measure of um of self-compassion for this study. So I was curious, so I looked it up because I was like, "Oh, I haven't really heard a lot about this as a measure. So I looked up to see what the um, questions were that they were asking people. And I found out that there are six dimensions um, to this. And so maybe I'll just like talk through each of them a little bit to give you a sense of what self-care is in like very high level overview. Yeah. But um, the first is the idea of not over identifying with things. So these are questions like when I fail at something important to me, I'm consumed by feeling inadequate or when I'm feeling down, I tend to obsess and then fixate on everything that's wrong. So over identification is really the idea of something goes wrong and I sort of dwell in the negative piece and all I can see is bad stuff. And it sounds um, like bad stuff about yourself. 
right? Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, bad stuff about yourself. And I guess the the second one, the first one is more about me uh, failing. The second one is like when I'm feeling down, it's not clear what you'd be feeling down about. Um, but it is about getting kind of stuck in this like spiral of negativity. Mm-hmm. So when you're engaging in self-care, you're trying to break yourself out of that spiral of negativity to say okay I've been dwelling on this negative thing and I'm going to make a conscious effort to try to get my mindset into a more positive place right so uh something positive about self-care or something you could do to show self-care to yourself would be to recognize when you're getting into a negative spiral and do something to disrupt that spiral whether that's engaging in an activity that you enjoy taking a break like or you know actively telling yourself like I'm in a negativity spiral I need to shift my way of thinking let me focus on something that is going well for a minute yeah that makes sense so it's um I mean, the care piece is very evident there right it's taking care of yourself to be in a more positive place Yes, exactly. Um, And the next one is called self-kindness. And self-kindness is being understanding and patient towards yourself when you do things that or think things that you don't particularly like. So everybody has aspects of themselves that they like and dislike. Um, So trying to be patient with yourself when you do something that you feel like, oh, like, you know, that was like a cringeworthy moment or whatever, like recognizing that everyone has those and being patient with yourself to get through that moment and realize that's not the totality of who you are. Um, And it also has to do with uh, giving yourself caring and attention when you're going through a hard time. So actually taking time to slow down, thinking about what you need, and that might um, manifest in like seeking professional help right like what is it that you actually need to give yourself the care and that's a place where like if a yoga class makes you feel like you get through a hard time better that's great as long as you're not just like oh you know what everyone says that yoga is self-care and I'm not feeling good I need self-care I should do yoga like that's not a good reason (laughs) but if you've really thought about it then um, it can be helpful so that self um kindness aspect is really like being patient with yourself and showing care to yourself when you're feeling bad about yourself or going through a hard time it's kind of like when we've told people many times I think on the podcast and a lot of the speaking engagements and things that we've done is allowing yourself to have grace give yourself grace for what you're dealing with during COVID that sounds like it'd be kind of the way we when we word it that way it kind of sounds like it's this kindness piece right yep exactly exactly yeah um And then the third one is mindfulness. And that is something we've talked about a lot. But in this particular scale, it has to do with keeping things in balance. So things like when something upsets me, I try to keep my emotions in balance. Uh, So really trying to make sure that you're, uh, again, um, not dwelling too heavily on the negative. Um, and when something painful happens, I try to take a balanced view of the situation. So mindfulness here really means like not getting mired down um, in the negative piece and really trying to incorporate more of that positivity in. That's that's an interesting definition of it, though, that it's like less about because there's a, a valence to the feelings versus I feel like mindfulness is generally kind of disconnecting from it. Yeah. I think it's kind of like stepping back and making sure you're seeing the whole picture might be a good way of saying, okay, like, I, I might be feeling really bad about something now, but I'm going to step back and make sure I'm taking a balanced view almost. Got it. Got it. That makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah, that does fit in then. Yeah. The, the next two I kind of see as opposites of each other. So I'm going to put them together isolation and viewing yourself as having commonality with humanity. So in this, avoiding isolation would be if you're feeling upset, feeling like most other people are probably happier than you are, or if you feel, if you fail at something that's important to you, feeling alone in your failure. So this idea of like, if things are going poorly for me, I feel like I'm the only person in the world that has bad things happening to them. And then the common humanity one is Um, reminding yourself that if you feel inadequate, most people share those feelings Um, or that if you fail, you see that as part of being human. So I kind of saw those two as going together. Like it's the idea that, you know, if you're, if things are going wrong for you or you haven't done something well, it's not that you're the only person in the world that's ever had that experience, but rather this is just part of being a human being. So you can kind of forgive yourself and accept it. Yeah. I see why you put those two together because I think that's a really good call out. Like 
And it's an interesting, all of everything that you're saying is super interesting when it comes to this concept of self-care, because it is very different than what you see and what we, and I know you've got more to go through, but uh, I think it is very interesting just as a commentary that's coming to my mind right now is like this idea of it's, you're not the only one that's done this or gone through this. And it's a normal part of the human experience. Like most people would never have defined self-care like that. If you, I'm sure if you look up the hashtag self-care on like Instagram, yep. like you've said, it's gonna be like bubble baths and things like that. Like it's not going right. to be um, saying, oh, today I recognize that this horrible thing I'm just dealing with is normal. Um, but yep. I feel like that is so important for your mental health to have that perspective and to really make sure that you're removing that isolation and realizing how you're connected and how you're not alone in your experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And, and just to throw the very last one in there, which is self judgment. Um, this is the idea of avoiding, um, being judgmental of your own flaws, being disapproving of yourself or intolerant of yourself, um, parts of yourself that you don't like. Um, and so I think like if you get into a place where you're feeling like I've done something wrong, it's because I'm not good at this. I'm the only person that's this bad at this thing. Um, and now all I can see is just negative around me. That's a time when you really probably need more self-care and self-care would be saying things to yourself. Like everybody has aspects of their personality that they don't like. There are other aspects of my personality that I really do like, or other things that I do that I'm actually really good at. This is part of being human that people fail and have to get back up and try again. Um, and you know, what, what do I need to do to be able to give myself the caring, that I, that I need in order to grow to a place where I can accept what has happened and move forward, understanding that this is all part of the journey. Right. So that's really where self-care should lead you to and signs that you might need self-care more on any given day. Yeah. The self-judgment piece is a sad one because I know what happens to a lot of people. I mean, all of us go through yeah. those moments where we're really not pleased with something about ourselves and it can be super hard but I think that what you just said was really valuable. This whole idea of the goal of self-care is to get you to a place where you can accept yourself and your circumstances and feel more positively about all of these things so that you're living a better life, right? You're not dwelling on the negative things in your life. You're not dwelling on your own flaws or mistakes that have happened or experiences that are hard, but you're able to kind of get yourself past them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So all of that's kind of a solution potentially to the problem that they're posing, which is that people are more likely now than ever to be experiencing workplace loneliness. So the baseline model that they're proposing is pretty straightforward. So I'll just unpack it really quickly. There are three things that they're looking at that are coming becoming more popular that might lead to workplace loneliness. One is working remotely. So just the frequency with which you work remotely in any given week. The other is job insecurity, feeling worried that you're going to get fired or have to leave your job before you would want to. And the other is a lack of information. So uh, feeling like you're receiving candid communications or uh an appropriate amount of information about things that are going on within your workplace. Um, so basically the amount of information you're receiving, how secure you feel in your job and the extent to which you're working remotely, each of those three things they think should predict whether or not you feel lonely and feeling lonely has to do with feeling like you don't have friends while you're working. You're not part of a group of friends. Uh, you feel kind of left out. You feel isolated. You feel withdrawn from others while you're working. Um, and what they propose is that the more of those three things that you have, um, you know, working remotely, job insecurity, and a lack of appropriate information, the more lonely you should be. And then the more lonely you are, the more depressed you would be. Um, and so they found support for that model that the more people were working from home, the more lonely they were and the more depressed they were, the more people felt insecure about their job, the more lonely they were and the more depressed they were. And the more people lacked information, the more lonely they were and the more depressed they were. I want to make it clear that this was measured during the beginning of COVID. So again, these were a lot of companies that were adjusting to working remotely for the first time. Mm -hmm. So I don't want people to hear the results and think, oh, if our workforce is going remote, it's going to make people lonely and depressed. 
there are ways that companies can do this well to mitigate those feelings of being alone and withdrawn and not talking to people. There are also ways that people can mitigate the other two factors, which might help like making people know that their job is secure and letting giving people appropriate information that might counterbalance some of the impacts of being physically removed from people. So there are definitely ways to bolster the impact of working remotely. But this was during a period of time where a lot of companies were not able to give it that thought. So I think the key takeaway that I would bring from the baseline model is if you want people to be working remotely and or people want to be working remotely, um, that's okay. You just have to figure out a way to make sure that people still feel connected to one another and maybe mitigate those other two factors to the extent that you can. Yeah. And I think interestingly, in the beginning of COVID, I think all of those things were fairly high for a lot of people, right? We're not only going, a lot of companies are going remote for the first time ever, but they were also um, dealing with potential job insecurity or feeling like there might be job insecurity because what's going to happen with this pandemic and where are we going and blah, blah, blah. And then in addition to that, I think we just didn't get all the information because we maybe didn't have information, right? So maybe companies were like, well, we're making these changes very quickly. And everyone's like, well, when am I coming back to work? Or when am I doing this? And people didn't have answers. So there was a lot of information gaps. And even if it wasn't intentional, it and probably maybe caused by things outside of the scope of the company being able to actually communicate or people around you or what have you. I think there was a lot of those three things happening at the same time yeah. at the beginning of the pandemic. So interestingly, that actually probably makes the study a little bit easier to do because you have these factors happening at kind of a higher level than you might in a normal situation. Um, yeah. Because I do think that all three of those factors, like you said, you can mitigate those things. And I think remote work done intentionally is very different than remote work done randomly or because of a crisis. Yeah. So for sure, that would be my takeaway not to be like, oh, remote work makes people depressed. Like that's there's so much research that shows that that's not the case. But when people are sort of adjusting to working in isolation for people and that hasn't been thoughtfully done, that could be a potential thing that you want to try to avoid. Right. So the idea is to be thoughtful about that. Um, So they found that those things predicted workplace loneliness and that workplace loneliness led to depression. They also found that workplace loneliness led people to help their coworkers less. Um, and so I want to just like uh, um, put that on pause though, because some of their results didn't work out for that. So that had, that had kind of like a funky finding. So I'm just going to keep working through the depression part of it. And then I'll give you like the little kind of sidebar about um, helping people. Okay. Um, but basically, um, People who had higher levels of self-compassion didn't experience as much depression stending, um, stemming from work loneliness as people who had lower levels of self-compassion. So the idea is if you are experiencing work loneliness and you practice these six components of self-compassion, you're less likely to experience the negative impacts that work loneliness can have on your mental health. So if you are feeling work loneliness, one way to address that would be to if you're a manager, for example, to shore up the parts of your work environment that uh, have to do with insecurity and providing people with appropriate amounts of communication and information and making sure that people are working remotely in a way that they still feel connected and a part of a community. But if you're in a situation where you can't change those things and you're experiencing work loneliness, to disrupt the pathway to feeling more depressed it could be super important for you to practice self-compassion. Um, so I think that's really the main takeaway of the paper is that there are these things that managers should pay attention to to make sure work loneliness doesn't exist. But if work loneliness does exist, in the meantime, while you're changing things, encouraging people to practice self-compassion, or if you're in an environment where you can't change those things, practicing self-compassion yourself can help head off some of those negative implications. I love that. that I mean, I feel like it's a very clear... Um, And I know you still have a sidebar on helping people, but I do feel like there's some really clear takeaways here. It's like, hey, if if you're feeling lonely at work, let make sure you're taking that time to honor what you need and to let yourself um, know that these experiences are not necessarily unique. You are, you know, your flaws are normal and fine. All those good things. Um, Yeah. And then hopefully that can help you not reach the state of depression. And then obviously clear takeaways from leaders to really focus in on how to make those connections, how to 
ensure we can provide some job security to people, how we can make sure we're communicating effectively across the organization. Like three very solid and maybe not always simple, but not necessarily expensive takeaways. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I really like overall in this paper, the definition of self-care and bringing that to the forefront as something that's not a product or service. Like you said, it's not necessarily expensive and it's a way that you can kind of consciously try to flip around your mindset when you feel yourself going down that path that can help you to disrupt your pathway towards feeling more depressed when you're starting to feel isolated or lonely. And again, the structural changes are the thing that's really going to solve the problem at the root cause. But we know not all employees will be in a situation where they can actually create those changes themselves. So um, at least there's something that we know that you can do as an individual to make that work. Um, What they uh, purported with regard to helping behavior, just so you know, is that um, the more lonely you are, the less likely you will be to help. And that's because they purported that as people started to like feel withdrawn and isolated, that they would assume that like the relationships weren't strong enough that it would make sense for them to like try to connect. There's other research that suggests that like if people feel isolated, they might try even harder to connect with others. Um, They did find that that was the case, um, that the more lonely people were, the less likely they were to help. Um, But interestingly, they found that self-compassion exacerbated that relationship so that people who are higher in self-compassion actually spent even more time focused on themselves and less time helping others. So it might make sense to say, okay, if I am high on loneliness, I'm going to withdraw from other people and not help. But if I'm high on self-compassion, that should like make me more likely to feel like I have the resources to help. Right. But what they found is that people who are high on self-compassion actually can serve even more resources and help people less. And they kind of took that as a sign that when you're high on self-compassion, you're really focusing on getting yourself right before you're trying to put any resources towards helping others. But it was a finding that they weren't expecting. So uh, they're not entirely sure why it turned out that way, which is why I kind of held it to the end because I think there are multiple ways we could look at that finding, but it's at least interesting for future research to consider. Yeah, that is really fascinating because I'm wondering if there's like, if we followed people long enough. So let's say I'm feeling lonely at work and I start practicing this self-compassion or self-care. And then over time, when I feel like I've, tackled that will I be able to then help more is there like a pause because I'm trying to address Mm -hmm. my own issues it's kind of the whole like idea of like with moms right like you need to take care of yourself to take care of your kids or whatever right like you need to take care or anything with women generally I feel like that's a thing that people say a lot like you need to make sure that you're taken care of before you can really provide help and support to other people otherwise you're going to burn out right so maybe that's the situation here maybe we're seeing people that are higher on self-compassion they're really working on getting themselves in a better place and they're going to focus on that first before they reach out. Yeah, that's basically what they're suggesting. They didn't expect that that was going to happen. So it's kind of like post hoc hypothesizing, you know, yeah. like, oh, maybe this is why that happened. Um, but uh, I thought it was at least interesting to add. But the the thing we can be more sure about, I think, is that um, in order to avoid the negative mental health consequences, self-care is really important. So if you're starting to feel yourself slipping into this slide of loneliness or you feel like your work team is feeling lonely and you have some control over the context, change that. And if you don't, practicing self-care could be a good way to help yourself avoid some of those negative consequences. Yeah, I love that. And I wonder, do you have any like specific types of things people can try to build up their self-care? They didn't really get too much into that. Um, I think that what I would suggest would be to think through thinking about the triggers. So being conscious about your thought patterns and processes. So if you feel yourself starting to really think about and getting stuck in the negativity of a situation, that could be a sign for you to say like, okay, I have to pay closer attention to what I'm thinking about and how I'm thinking. And even just that like shift of recognizing that you're in that loop could help you to sort of try to put yourself in a mindset of 
around self-care, like, okay, what do I need to get myself out of this? What helps me to feel cared for? How can I take time to engage in that activity? How can I make sure that I'm remembering the positive things that are around me? Let me recall a time that I was successful. So like, I think just recognizing the signs of like, when you get into a place where you're low on self-care might help to trigger you to do some things to start boosting yourself out of it. Yeah. I think that's a good, good call out. Like really thinking about what it is that you need, what your thought processes processes are and where you are today and what you can do to get yourself into different space. And I think that can look very different for different people. And so it's figuring out what that is for you. How do you get yourself to feel more compassionate towards yourself? How do you feel how do you get yourself to kind of get out of this place of judgment and negativity and what are the things that have generally done that for you in the past and maybe trying some of those when you're in this situation to help you get further out and maybe there's some research or an article we can find in the future that can talk about how to actually build that because I'm curious I feel like there must be something or something is coming and being done yeah they do mention offering self-compassion training at work but then There's not like a lot of detail about what that might entail. So um, maybe that's something we should look into to see what is involved in self-compassion training because that's not something I've heard of before. Um, But they say in the article that people should look into that. So Hmm. perhaps that's something we should look into. Yeah, that's a good call. That's interesting. I would be curious to learn more about that. Yes, me too. So yeah. So uh sad topic but at least there's a silver lining which I guess is part of the purpose of (laughs) self-care yes thank you so much for sharing this article I really um yeah I found it very interesting I'm very curious to see like what additional work comes of this but I think it's really important for all of our listeners to make sure that if they're feeling lonely if they're not feeling connected to people at work Um, think about ways you can get connected and then think about ways that you can really take care of yourself so that you don't spiral into more negativity and into depression. So take care of yourselves out there. Um, and yeah, hopefully this article was helpful for everyone. So thank you for sharing it. Thank you for listening. For all of our wonderful listeners out there, please um, let us know if you have any questions, concerns, thoughts. You can find us at workerbeing.com. You can email us at contact at workerbeing.com. You can also find us on social media at workerbeing on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And as always, if you found this helpful, share our show and subscribe for more. Thanks for listening. The Worker Being Podcast is hosted by us, Patricia Grabar and Katina Sawyer, and produced by Allie Johnson.